Let's go on a journey from the very basics, like the electrons in atoms, to valence and conduction bands, doping, the PN junction, and finally, the diode. An atom has a center called the nucleus, and tiny particles called electrons moving around the nucleus in shells or orbits. Each shell can hold a certain number of electrons depending on the type of atom or element. The outermost shell of an atom is very important. It decides how that atom will behave. The electrons in the outermost shell are called valence electrons. Now let's talk about silicon, the hero of our story. Silicon is an element found in sand and is very common in nature. It has four valence electrons. That means in its outermost shell, it has four electrons. If you take a lot of silicon atoms and put them together, they form a crystal. In this crystal, each silicon atom shares its four electrons with four neighboring silicon atoms. This sharing forms covalent bonds. The result is a solid, stable structure, where every atom is tightly connected. But here's the thing. At room temperature, all the electrons are tightly held in their places, and there are no free electrons which are needed to carry current. That means pure silicon doesn't conduct electricity well, and therefore, it's almost an insulator. So how do we make it useful? Let's imagine energy levels of the electrons in an atom like floors in a building. The electrons in the outer shell of atoms live on a lower floor called the valence band. Now, there is another floor higher up. This is called the conduction band. Electrons in this band are free to move around, and when they move, they carry electric current. Between these two floors is a gap the band gap. In the case of insulators, this gap is very large, so electrons can't easily jump across and therefore they cannot conduct electricity. For conductors, there is no gap at all, and therefore electrons can move freely as the bands overlap. But for semiconductors like silicon, the gap is moderate, not too small and not too big, just right to control. At room temperature, very few electrons naturally get the energy to jump from the valence band up to the conduction band. That's why pure silicon is not a good conductor. We need a way to get more electrons up there in order to improve conductivity and make silicon useful in electronic devices. For that, here comes the brilliant trick called doping. Doping means adding a small amount of another material, called an impurity, to the silicon in order to improve its conductivity. Let's first look at atoms with five valence electrons like phosphorus. When a phosphorus atom replaces a silicon atom in the crystal, four of its electrons form covalent bonds as usual. But that fifth one? It has no bond to form, it's free. The extra electrons from five valence electron impurities have enough energy to jump directly into the conduction band where they can move freely and carry current, something that doesn't happen easily in pure silicon. This kind of doped silicon is called N-type material. The N stands for negative, because electrons carry negative charge. Now, consider the case of atoms with three valence electrons, like boron. When boron replaces a silicon atom, it can only form three bonds. There's one missing bond. A kind of hole. Electrons from neighboring atoms can jump to fill this hole, leaving a new hole behind, kind of like musical chairs. The hole acts like a positive charge carrier because the absence of a negative charge is like a positive one. So this is called P-type material, where P means positive. Super duper easy till now, right? Now, here comes the magic. Let's place a piece of N-type silicon next to a piece of P-type silicon. The point where they meet is called a P-N junction. At first, something very interesting happens. The free electrons on the N side notice empty spots, or holes, on the P side and start moving over to fill them. When an electron leaves the N side, 
it leaves behind a positive charge because it was part of a neutral atom before. And when it enters the P side and fills a hole, it adds a negative charge there. So now, near the junction, a layer of positive charges is left behind on the N side, and a layer of negative charges builds up on the P side. This creates a special region around the junction where there are no free electrons or holes left to carry current. This area is called the depletion region. It's like a barrier or a dry zone, emptied of all the mobile charge carriers that could normally move and create current. See, there will be an electric field generated because of these charges in this direction, right? So now this electron will feel a kind of repulsive force due to this electric field, a force in this direction because this is negatively charged. Similarly, any hole trying to move from the P side toward the N side will feel a force pulling it back in this direction, right? That's why the flow of charge stops and the depletion region becomes stable, acting like a barrier. The strength of this electric field creates what we call a barrier voltage, just like a small battery built right into the junction. For silicon, this barrier voltage is around 0.7 volts. That means unless we apply an external voltage greater than this barrier voltage, current won't flow across the junction. Now let's take this PN junction and connect two wires to it, one on each side. What we now have is called a diode, which is one of the simplest but most powerful components used in electronics. Suppose we connect the positive terminal of a battery to the P side and the negative terminal to the N side. This setup is called forward bias. Biasing simply means applying an external voltage across the diode to control its behavior. In this case, the battery pushes electrons from the N side toward the junction, and at the same time, it pulls holes from the P side toward the junction. Now remember, there is already a built-in electric field in the depletion region that tries to stop this movement. But if the battery's voltage is more than this barrier voltage, then the battery's push is stronger than the barrier's resistance. As a result, electrons and holes now have enough energy to cross the junction, meet on the other side, and flow. And so, current begins to flow through the diode. But what if we connect the battery in the opposite way? Let's say the positive terminal goes to the N side and the negative terminal to the P side. This is called reverse bias. In reverse bias, the battery is no longer helping. In fact, it's making things worse for current to flow. It pulls electrons even further away into the N side and pulls holes deeper into the P side. This makes the depletion region wider. The electric field at the junction becomes stronger, and it becomes nearly impossible for any charge carriers to cross the junction. So, no current flows, except for a very tiny leakage current, which is usually too small, and we generally ignore them. This happens because the electric field blocks most charge carriers, but a few electrons or holes from thermal energy still manage to cross it, causing a tiny leakage current. Similarly, in case of forward bias, if the voltage is below the barrier, like less than 0.7 volts, a small number of carriers still get enough energy from heat to cross the junction, so a little current can flow. But it's very small and almost close to zero. We can now look at the IV characteristic graph of a diode, which shows how current I changes with applied voltage V. In forward bias, as the voltage increases slowly, current remains very small until the voltage crosses a certain threshold or the barrier voltage. After that, current rises rapidly with even a small increase in voltage. In reverse bias, current stays almost zero, with only a tiny leakage current flowing. But if reverse voltage becomes too high, the electric field across the depletion region becomes extremely strong. This high field can rip electrons out of their atoms, creating a sudden flow of charge. As a result, a large current starts flowing in the reverse direction. 
This is called breakdown, and if not controlled, it can overheat and permanently damage the diode. Great. Now this is just the beginning. If we get 7,000 likes, then in the next video, I will show you how the same PN junction concept is extended to create something even more powerful called the transistor, which later became the core component of all modern electronic devices. So good!